R clone is a really neat program that runs across platform, but we're going to look at it in Linux. And it is kind of a competitor to the idea of file stream that Google does. Now, the nice thing is R clone will work on a multitude of cloud based storage systems. We're just going to specifically look at Google Cloud because it has this amazing uh, feature that if you are a business user of G Suite, you can get unlimited storage. Now, uh, like I said, it's a lot like file stream, but what makes it different is that when you have Google Drive, and you install file stream it has this feature that allows it to be like another drive letter on your system so basically you just have like a G drive by default and then anything that you can uh, use a regular drive for you can use file stream for copy files there copy files away from it whereas with our clone it's a little bit different you can make it function just like that the nice thing is one it has a Linux client so we're gonna look at it in Linux uh, you can use it just like a regular drive mount but you can also do things things like uh, sync like you would rsync, copy, move, all of those things. But I'm going to directly compare it to file stream because it does the same thing where it'll allow you to have a file share. But there are some limitations and frustrations that come with Google file stream that just aren't there with our clone. So let's first of all look at I have Google file stream installed on this computer and you can see I'm logged into my CBT Nuggets account. We have G Suite. So that means I have unlimited storage on my account. Now, the thing I want to point out here is notice that it says that there's a local cache directory and this can really be an issue with Google file stream and it can be a little frustrating. Now we could change it to something with a bigger drive, but here's the thing. It mounts as G. That's just another setting here. So the drive letter is G just like any other drive on your system. But this caching thing can become a little bit of an issue because while it is a drive letter on my system, you can see the G drive is here. Notice it says I have 61.7 gigabits free or gigabytes free out of 118 gigabytes. Well, I thought this was supposed to be unlimited. You'll notice this happens to be very similar to this. And that's because it's looking at how much local drive cache I have on my system rather than how much total storage is out on my Google Drive. And this means if we try to copy, like let's say I highlight 100 gigabytes of data and I try to drag it to this folder, it's going to say I don't have enough space on the drive. And that can be very frustrating, even if it works. Now, don't get me wrong. Google File Stream is really powerful and it works really, really well on a Mac or Windows system. It doesn't install on Linux at all. But I really, really like to use our clone instead because it treats it just like a file system that's remote, but you get to use the full size regardless regardless of what your local computer is able to cache or store as it copies it back and down. Let me show you what I mean. So right now I'm SSH'd over to a Linux server in my local network called Cloud Files. And this is just a DF-H to see all of the hard drives and block devices and stuff on my system. Now, the one I want to point out specifically is Gcrypt. Now, this is my G drive from CBT Nuggets that happens to be encrypted. We're going to talk about that in a later nugget. And it's mounted on my local system in mount cbt g drive now here's the cool thing notice it says i'm using 4.7 terabytes of space but i have a petabyte of space available which means if i try to copy a whole bunch of files there's not going to be any problem at all with local cache storage because if you look up here my local device here uh let's see uh, right here it's using two percent it's a 92 gigabyte drive i've only used one uh, 0.2 gigabytes, but there's no limitation down here. I could copy a hundred gigabytes to my Google G drive using our clone, and it's not going to choke because of any local disk space. Now, like I said, Google File Stream is really cool. There's nothing wrong with Google File Stream, but our clone just gives you a lot more options, including things like encryption, mounting on Linux, um, R syncing, all sorts of things that it will do in addition to all of the things that Google does. Also, it's open source. It's free. It's not like this is a premium feature that you're paying for. It just means that you can use our clone to do things above and beyond what Google will offer. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Now, our clone is just a regular application that you install in Linux. But one of the cool things is that while it is going to be in your package manager, it's actually better to go online and get the latest version of our clone because it's just a single executable file. There's no libraries to install. And that way you can have the most recent version. Now, I'm here on an Ubuntu system. And if we were to look for so apt search, oops, not a search, apt search 
our clone it's going to show that yes it is in our repository down here our clone uh version 1.36 but as of the time of this recording we're up to like 1.51 so while we could install this and a lot of the stuff would work i really really recommend you install it directly from uh, the website from the our clone website and i know that goes against everything i normally say normally i'm all about using your package manager to make sure you have the most recent version and all the libraries are up to date but in this case since it's just one single Single executable file it really makes sense to get the most recent version because then you're gonna have all the latest features all the latest bug fixes regardless of what version your Linux operating system is on and what version of our clone happens to be in the repository so you can either just download the zip file from their website or you can use their built-in installer now I don't like to just execute things online uh, what you would do here is you would say something like curl HTTPS clone slash slash rclone.org forward slash install.sh and then you would pipe that into sudo bash and that's going to actually execute that installer before we do that I like to look at what I'm running so I'm just going to put this into a file and then let's look at that file let's see what it actually does okay and this is pretty safe I've obviously looked at this before uh, but we can see that there is a whole bunch of stuff it it makes sure that um, you have the proper tools installed like unzip uh, it's going to see if you want the beta channel or not it's going to create temporary directories it's going to install the man pages which aren't necessary but it's nice to have the man pages installed you know the manual pages on your system and it detects what operating system you have again this works on Linux uh, various uh, other like Unixes and it'll work on different platforms like 64-bit or ARM etc etc and it just downloads it and it actually will do it in a way that will update what you currently have installed if you already have our clone you can execute this again and it will update it to the most recent version and it's just a really nice safe script to use so I'm just going to quit out of here and I will actually pipe it right in to bash so I'm gonna say that use the pipe symbol sudo bash it's going to download it it'll execute that script and do a whole bunch of other stuff like I said it'll check for things it'll install the man pages it's going to download and install everything onto our system and that's it it is installed we can tell by saying our clone and there we go our clone is installed and we can type our clone dash dash version to see what version we have installed and sure enough it's 1.51 as opposed to 1.36 which is what was in our repository on ubuntu and installing our clone is that easy you can either use your package manager and you'll get a version that's not quite as up to date as installing directly from their website or you can use that script they provide to install the most recent version directly on your system and then to update it you just run that same script again and it will update to the most recent version even if you've already installed our clone using the script before i hope this has been informative for you and i'd like to thank you for viewing now, by default, our clone will allow you to install and use cloud services without setting up any additional API access. However, there is a problem if you choose to do it that way because our clone has an account or an API application set up with Google and it allows for, I don't know how many, but a whole ton of API accesses and everybody who's using our clone is going to use one every time they access their G drive and that's not a problem except there's a lot of people using our clone and so if you are using their pool of API tokens you're going to run out and you're going to run into delays so what you want to do is if you're going to use our clone with Google Drive which is what we're doing you want to set up your own application API so that you are not using the pool that the our clone project has you're using your own pool of API calls and you're not going to have to worry about running out of stuff based on what other people are doing now it is a process but it's not terribly difficult to do and you can do it with any sort of Gmail account or Google G Suite accounts now this is my actual CBT Nuggets account that I'm logged into and you can see I'm using almost nine terabytes of storage and that's because you'll see down here it is unlimited the amount of storage that I can put on uh, Google Drive 
Here, however, I'm logged into Bob Nugget's account on Gmail, and he only has 15 gigabytes of storage. Now, he's not using any, but 15 gigabytes is the maximum. So if you're using an account with a limited amount of storage in Google Drive, you're going to have the same limitation when you use R clone. So if you don't have unlimited storage on Google Drive, you're not going to have unlimited storage in R clone. All this is is an access point to your storage on G Drive. But if you have G Suite and it's a business edition, you probably have access to unlimited storage on that account. And if not, it's $12 a month to set one up for a single user. Now, if you set up G Suite for a single user, a business G Suite account, it says that for one to five users or one to four users, you're going to only get one terabyte of storage per user. But I've never seen anybody that has that actual limitation if they only have one single user on their G Suite account. So officially, you don't get unlimited storage until you have at least five users on your G Suite account. However, if you have just one user, you probably have unlimited storage anyway. So you're going to have to figure out if that's worth it to you uh, to only have the one single account. But it's you set up the API access and R clone the same way regardless. You're just going to have a limitation if you don't have that much storage available in your account. So in order to set up API access, you need to go over to Google's Developers Console. Now, I've created a short link here, snar.co, snarco forward slash rclone ID, and this will just take you directly to a shortcut, or take you to this spot in the rclone documentation that will show you how to go through the process, okay? So the first thing is we log into the Google API Console, so I'm going to click on that. And you can actually leave this open in another window. In fact, we'll do that. We'll leave it open in another window. So I'm just going to click and open it over here. And the first time we log in, we're going to have to agree to services and continue. And then if you have a project already, you can add API access to it. But I don't actually have any projects. So I need to create a new project. And I'm going to call this one our clone. I'm going to click create. And then if we look over here on our instructions, it says then go to enable APIs and services and search for Drive and Google Drive API. So, all right, over here, enable APIs and services are right there. So click there. And now I'm going to type in Drive because I'm searching for Google Drive API. Sure enough, there it is. So enable. In our next step, we click credentials on the left-hand side of the panel and then create credentials. So over here, so don't click this, that's gonna be a wizard. So click over here, credentials. And the first thing we need to do is configure the consent screen for OAuth stuff. So click here and it's going to ask us if we want it to be an external available to any user with a Google account or internal. Now this is gonna be a little bit different if you are a G Suite user. So a G Suite user, you're gonna to wanna to make it internal so it doesn't have to be submitted for app verification. Uh, but for our case, we're using a non G Suite account. We're just using Gmail. So we have to do external. See, I can't even check internal, but if you're using a G Suite account, you wanna do internal internal because then way, that way it's immediately accessible. So I'm going to click accessible or external, click create. The name of the app is going to be our clone. Can leave all of this the same. Okay. So back over here in credentials. Now we can now do create credentials OAuth client ID. If you remember, that's what it told us we needed to do credentials OAuth client ID. And we already did the consent screen product name because it, we had to do that or it wouldn't show us this OAuth thing. All right, so an application type of other and click create. The default name is fine. So come back over here. Other default name is fine. Click create. And here we go. This is what we need. So you need to copy the client ID and the secret. Now you should know I'm going to erase this as soon as we're done. So this isn't something that you can use. Uh, however, this client ID, so copy and paste this somewhere. Like notepad. And then the secret, copy that into notepad and we're going to need these when we set up our clone in the next nugget so hold on to this client id and secret because that's what we're going to need once you have that client id and secret you're ready to set up our clone but that's it for this nugget i hope this has been informative for you and i'd like to thank you for viewing 
In order to get our clone to mount our remote drives, we have to set up the configuration file. And thankfully, there's a really nice wizard to go about doing that. Now, we've already installed our clone on our Ubuntu machine. And when we create the file, it's actually going to create a file called rclone.conf. And it's going to create it in our home directory inside the .config file or folder inside a folder called rclone. That's where this is going to be created. Now, it's important to know this file is going to contain everything we need to connect remotely without any other authentication. So when we set up our clone, this file, even though it lives in here, we can copy it to another server, to another workstation, to anywhere we want. And as long as we have this file that we're going to configure, we'll be able to connect without the need for uh, adding a secret or anything like that in the future. So this file is very important for us to know where it is again in this folder, and know that it's portable to other systems. All the information we will need is right in there. Now I'm here on our Ubuntu box, and if we look inside dot config, we're going to see we have a folder named rclone, but inside there, there should not be anything because I erased everything in there. So we don't have any configuration file now, but like I said, there's a wizard. So we can just type rclone config and it's going to walk us through creating our configuration file. In fact, it tells us right here where it's going to be stored. So it says it's not found. So it's using the defaults. Uh, I'm going to walk you through this new remotes found, make one. We're going to do a new remote. So N uh, we're going to name it. I'm going to call this uh, Bob drive because again, we're using Bob Nuggets account and you'll see there are a ton of online cloud things that they support. So we can go through this. I mean, it can be everything from an SSH connection uh, to uh, an Azure blob, open drive, all of these various things are gonna be here. Uh, Backblaze, Amazon Cloud Drive, really. We're gonna use Google Drive. Now notice, read closely here. It says Google Cloud Storage. This is not Google Drive. So we don't want 12, we want 13, which is our Google drive. We can also mount Google photos with our clone. It's just crazy how powerful it is, but we're going to choose 13. So I'm going to scroll back down. I'm going to say storage type 13. And this is where it's going to ask us for the client ID that we use. Now, if we do it blank, remember we can leave this blank, but then it's just going to use our clones own API calls and they're going to get exhausted. We're going to have slowdown. So we're going to use the client ID and secret that we created in our last nugget. So I'm just going to copy this copy come over here i'm going to paste it press enter it's going to ask for our secret which again we have right here so copy this and paste that all right, and now we have some options here how we want to create this configuration because we can create a share that we only have read access or that we have only read access to certain uh, places in our drive. For example, there is an application data folder that you can't see on the web interface. But what I'm going to do is just do the full access to all the files, excluding that application folder. What I want is access to the files in my Google Drive, just like you see them in the web interface. So I'm just going to select the first one here, the default of one. Actually, it's not default. I have to type in one. So my scope is going to be this first one, but read through. There's a lot of options that we have there. Okay. And now it says the ID of the root folder. This means where do I want our clone to look when it enters my Google drive? Now by default, it just uses the root level, which is what I want. I want to see my entire drive when I connect to it. So I'm just going to leave this blank and press enter. If we were to type a, a folder name here, that would be the root of what our clone saw. So if we only wanted our clone to see a certain portion of our Google drive, we could create a folder and then tell it the root folder ID is a specific folder, but I'm just going to hit enter. And now the service account file. This is only if we're doing a different kind of interactive login. Just for us, this is going to just be default. So press enter. And now in order to authenticate, we have to actually log in via the web and authorize the access to it. Um, oh, advanced config. I'm going to say no. The default is no. So hit no. All right. Now it's going to say, how do we do the, the remote config? Like I said, that authorization. Now I happen to be on a machine with a GUI, but a lot of times you're doing this on a headless machine. So if we say yes, it'll just pop up a, a nice little web browser for us. I'm going to say no and pretend we're on a headless machine so that you see the process. It's a little more complicated, but not bad. So I'm going to say no. And what it does is it gives us this link. It says, okay, copy this and go to a web browser somewhere. Like it can be on another computer even. Again, ours happens to be a computer that has a web browser here because we're in a GUI. But if this was in a headless machine, we could copy, open a web browser, 
paste this in. So paste and go. Okay, it says what account do we want to use. I'm going to use Mr. Bob Nugget's account here. So I'll click there. It says this app isn't verified by Google. That's okay. This is the app that we just set up. So I'm just going to say advanced. Go down here. Since I set this up, I know it's safe. And it says go to our clone unsafe. Yes. Okay, do I want to grant permission to see, edit, create, and delete all of my Google Drive files? That sounds scary, but yes, I'm going to say allow. All right, make sure I trust it. Yes, I do. Allow. Okay, here. Now, this is the code that it gives us in the web browser. I'm just going to click the copy button here. I don't know if it copied, so I'm going to say copy what's highlighted. And then down here, when it says enter the verification code, that's what it's talking about. So here I can just paste that in, press enter. Configure this as a team drive. Nope, I'm just going to accept the default. No, this is just for me, Bob Nugget. All right, and is this okay? Let's see, this is my token, blah, blah, blah. Here's all the information. Is this okay? Yes, I'm just going to select the default of yes, this is okay. And that's all I want to do for right now. So I'm just going to do Q for quit. But notice up here, Bob Drive is my type of Google Drive. Okay, so this is important for us to look at. Bob Drive is the name of it. I'm going to quit. And now if I do R clone, LSD, which is not the drug, but rather LS, the directories and files on the remote. And then how we specify it is the name, so Bob Drive, and then a colon at the end. That's how we specify to our clone what share or what drive that we've created, what we want to look at. So I press enter. It's going to connect. Notice there was no authorization that it asked for, uh, but it showed us all the contents of Bob's drive, which happens to be nothing. So let's change that really quick. Go up here, drive google.com so on our google drive here let's create a folder so uh, let's see new folder we'll call this uploads and we'll go in here let's actually put a file in here so let's open up our file directory uh, pictures there happens to be that really cool cbt background image so i'm going to drag this over it should upload it there he is. CBT Gold is right there. Now, if we come back over here and we do R clone LSD Bob Drive, we should see that folder uploads. And then if we do R clone LS Bob Drive colon, we can do, I think we can just actually do uploads. I'm not sure if we need the slash or not. Yeah, sure enough. And then inside there, CBT Gold is right there. All right, so LS, LSD shows the folders. Uh, LS is going to show the files. And we can see now remotely that we have access to it without needing to authenticate from the command line at all. And that's because if we go into config our clone and look at our clone.conf, we can see we have that access token and everything is in here that we used before in order to contact our client ID, our secret, and then a, the token to access it. So we don't have to re-enter stuff. It just remembers it and gives us access to it. Now, once we've set up our clone and we set up all the configurations, we have a ton of other really cool stuff we can do. We can sync, we can copy, we can mount. But the first step is to get it configured. And thankfully, now that we are able to do that, we have our clone set up and we can access our remote file shares right from the command line. I hope this has been informative for you. And I'd like to thank you for viewing. Once we get our clone all set up and installed and running like it is now, we can do some pretty common command line things, copy, movie, moving, sync, all of these things back and forth as if we were using local commands. In fact, Linux has commands like ls and cp and mv for move and rsync for syncing from one directory to another. Our clone has something similar. Uh, they have ls, which we've already looked at. You actually have to spell out copy, move, and then it's sync in order to sync one directory to look like another. And this one can be pretty dangerous, to be quite honest, because sync will delete anything remotely that doesn't match what your source is. So sync is something you want to use very cautiously. I really recommend that you use copy or move more often because these don't necessarily delete things on the destination if they don't exist on the source, whereas sync will, I mean, it'll make them look the same even if, even if that's not what you intended. There is a dry run flag that you can use. And if you want to do syncing, I recommend maybe you do a dry run first. You just add this to the R clone flag and it will um, show you what it's going to do without actually doing any of that deletion. So this is a nice thing that exists, but just remember sync can be a very dangerous and powerful tool, but it's pretty easy. And like I said, line up really closely to the Linux command line tools as well. So let's check it out. 
And here on Ubuntu, we're in our command line. Our clone is already set up, and I just want to show you inside the downloads folder here. I made a couple folders. So there's two folders, files and photos. Inside files, I just have a couple text files. And then inside photos, I just have a couple of the, the two little graphics that we had. I put them inside here. And I put them inside the downloads folder because I want to make sure you realize something unique about the way our clone copies things, okay? First of all, let's look at the remote our clone uh, share, which should be empty. So our clone ls bob drive colon and it should just be empty so there's nothing over there at all now what we can do is our clone copy downloads we can was the slash or without a slash it doesn't matter and that's the source the destination is going to be bob drive colon and we'll press enter it's going to copy all of the stuff and it does it recursively which is really nice but the thing i want to show you is now i copied downloads you would probably expect there to be a folder called downloads over there but that's not what actually happens so if we look in an ls it's going to see you're going to see that we have folders but only the folders that were inside downloads so when you copy a folder it actually copies the things inside there so that's a little bit of an annoyance um, but nonetheless as long as you know that's what's going to happen you can do things Things to uh, fix that or mitigate that issue that might throw you for a loop at first. So here we have this over there. So I'm going to actually delete everything over there. So I'm going to say our clone, delete, Bob Drive, colon. Now this is going to delete everything just as a warning. Everything's going to be gone. So our clone, delete, Bob Drive. It's going to completely empty it out. And if we do an LS, we're going to see, sure enough, it's empty. Okay. If we wanted to recreate it just like this, we would have to say our clone, copy, downloads, Bob Drive colon downloads. And then it's going to actually create a folder called downloads over there and put our stuff in it. And we can tell because as soon as it's finished, we can do an LS and we can see the downloads files. So it's created it just like it was on our local, uh, but we had to specify to create that folder because copy just does files inside of a folder. That's just a little nuance. And all of the commands are like that. Move, copy, sync, they all work the same. Okay, so um, let's delete this again really quick. So now everything is over there is deleted. If we do an LS, it's going to be empty. But if we did, instead of a copy, we could do a move. So our clone move downloads to Bob Drive downloads. And it's going to do the exact same thing, except this time, instead of making a copy, it's going to move it. So now if we look inside downloads, oh, it didn't actually move them. That's weird. Oh, it did. Okay. It doesn't. I'm sorry. There is a flag to remove the local empty folders, whereas by default it doesn't. So we have our folders, but notice there's no files in them. But if we look over on Bob Drive, it is going to be there. So LS Bob Drive. And sure enough, they are there. Now, if we wanted to move them back, we could say our clone move. And the source could be Bob Drive downloads. And our destination could be downloads here. And now if we do our clone LS Bob Drive, and I see there's nothing there, but if we do an LS of downloads, we're going to see our files are back. There are the big text and the creds. That flag I was talking about, if we were to actually say our clone move dash dash delete empty SRC DERS, and then we were to say downloads and move that to Bob Drive downloads. Now when this moves over, then we're going to see that it's going to get rid of those local source directories. By default, it doesn't. But if we look, boom, they're gone. There's nothing in there. So if we want to move it back, which I kind of do, I want to have them back here. It will recreate them. And if we do our clone LS Bob Drive, we should see that it's going to be empty again. Okay, so anyway, that is how we can move things, copy things. If we want to sync, though, that's where things get really scary. Because regardless of what is over there, if we do an R clone sync, and I'm going to do dash V so we see what's actually going on. Our downloads folder to Bob Drive colon, and it's just going to do it to the root directory because I didn't specify downloads. But if we do this, it's going to sync it over, which is works just like copy does, with the exception that if a change takes place locally and we do it again, it will make it ex an exact copy of remotely. So if we do our clone ls Bob Drive, we're going to see that we have our files over there, right? They're, they're just like they would expect there. But let's say we said rm uh, minus rf downloads star. 
Okay, so now there's nothing inside downloads. If we were to do that sync command again, I would see everything over there was deleted. If we do an ls, we're going to see, boom, it's empty because it did a, a sync command and it copied everything over, including deletion. See, it deleted those files as well. So really, it works very similarly to the Linux command line itself for things like copying, moving, and syncing files. You need to understand that it doesn't create that root level folder unless you specify it on, by name, you know, right after the colon, like we did in our downloads folder. But it's not really difficult to understand what's going on, and especially be careful of syncing, because syncing will copy over deletions as well. If you delete something locally and sync it, it's going to delete it remotely. And when it's gone, it is gone. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Now, being able to access a remote share using our clone is, is really awesome. And if, if nothing else, if you could just access remotely on the command line without worrying about authentication constantly, that would be enough. But here's the deal. Our clone allows you to encrypt all of the files and folders on your remote R clone share. And that means that if you have like, uh, like me and you're using a, a remote Google drive using your work account, you can have all of your personal files encrypted there. So you can utilize that unlimited storage, but not worry that your personal uh, privacy is being compromised because everything is stored encrypted remotely. And when you see it locally, it's all unencrypted. It's like magic. It's actually, it's just so cool. Another nice thing is you don't have to encrypt your entire drive. So we have our clone and it connects over to our G drive or our Google drive. On the remote Google drive, we can still have our total unencrypted uh, folder, kind of like we did in our last nugget, where we have the downloads folder and a bunch of files inside of it. Then alongside that, we can have another folder and we're going to call ours crypt. And everything inside the crypt folder is going to be encrypted. All the folder names are going to be encrypted. All the files are going to be encrypted. The file names are going to be encrypted. So everything over there is going to be completely invisible, right? Nobody's going to be able to know what's over there. The only thing they'll be able to tell is like the file size because, uh, you know, the encrypted file is going to be about the same size. But as far as what the contents are or what the folder names are, it's all going to be completely hidden and encrypted. So you don't have to worry about your personal safety being compromised. And just like our original setup for the, the downloads folder for our G drive setup, setting up an encrypted folder is super duper super easy. And we can use the same wizard that we set up our original G drive with. And I'm just going to do it inside of our remote clone or our remote R clone share. And if we do R clone, there's nothing over there right now. So R clone LS Bob drive, there's going to be nothing over there at all right now. So let's do R clone config. Okay. It shows us what we already have set up. We have a Bob drive already set up. And what I want to do is create a new remote. So the process is going to start just like we're doing another G drive, but it's going to be a little bit different. But start with N. We're going to name it. I'm going to call this one Crypt. And if we scroll up, we'll see number 10 is called Encrypt Decrypt a Remote. And that's what we want. We want to use Crypt. Now we could either type 10 or the word Crypt. I'm going to do 10. We did the last time by typing 13. But 10 is Crypt. So let's go back down here and type 10. And it says, okay, so what remote is it that you want to uh, encrypt or decrypt? Now, normally it should contain a colon and a path. And what that means is we could do the entire drive, right? We could just say we want to use the remote of Bob Drive colon, but that would encrypt the entire thing. What I want to do is create a folder inside of it, or here their terminology is a bucket, okay? So I'm going to say Bob Drive, and I called it Crypt. Remember, that's what I said I was going to call it. So I'm going to call it Crypt. And press enter. And now, what is it we want to do? We have a couple different ways that we can go about doing it. If we do the standard, it's going to encrypt the file names themselves as well. Or we could do simple file name obfuscation, which I don't want to do. Or we could not encrypt the file names at all, which means that we would see what the file names are, just their contents would be encrypted. Well, I want to encrypt everything. I want to encrypt the file names. I want to encrypt the folders. I want everything encrypted. So I'm going to pick one. And here's where it says, what do we want to do with the directory names? The same thing. We could have the directory names uh, be intact. So just the names and the contents of the files are encrypted. But again, I want the directory names encrypted too. I want everything to be hidden. So I'm going to say one. 
And now here's where we have to come up with a passphrase. So I can say uh, Y to type in my own password or G to generate a random password. Um, I'm going to use their random password. So I'm going to say G, the password strength in bits. How secure do I want it? Well, we can pick anywhere from 64, 128, or 1024. I'm going to, it says that 128 is secure. I'm going to go with 128. Again, I'm not necessarily trying to make this hack proof anyway. I just want to make sure that people aren't snooping on my files. Uh, so I'm just going to say 128 bits press enter. It gives me my password. Now I'm going to make a copy of this password. Let's actually open a text editor and I'm going to make a copy of this password. Your password is here. All right. It says, do I want to use that? Yes. I want to use that. So now a password for assault. Now this is a assault password. It just, it just uh, basically obfuscates the password in our configuration file. So it's not as easily viewable. Uh, I wanted to generate one as well. So I'm going to say G to generate again. And it says, again, how many bits do we want? I'm going to say 128 bits. Again, you can pick whichever one you want. You can do 1024 if you want to be the most secure. I'm going to do that. It says my salt password is this one. So I'm going to copy this. Just going to keep this somewhere secure. Okay. Paste that. I'm going to say my, just so I know. Oop, what did I do? Oh, I kind of pasted it twice on accident. Okay. I'm going to put here that it's my salt, just so I know. All right. So that's up there. Uh, do I want to, let's see, uh, use this password? Yes, of course. So the default is yes. I'm going to press enter. All right. So here is the configuration that it created. So Bob drive crypt standard encryption. The password is encrypted. Is this okay? Yes. I'm going to say it's okay. And then I'm going to quit. All right. Now I want to show you really quick. If we go into config our clone, and we look at our rclone.comp file, this is the new share. Just like our Bob drive up here is all set, it just added another uh, share to it, and this is crypt. Now notice the password, this is not the same password up here. Remember, they applied salt, so these are a little bit obfuscated, just so people snooping aren't going to see our encrypted password. That's why it's important to keep this. If we wanted to recreate this, let's say we lost our rclone.comp file, and we had to recreate it using the same passwords to make sure we could have access, to the encrypted files, we need these original password and the salt password so we can recreate exactly like this. Rather than having them generate one, we would say we want to use our own and we would use these. And that's how we would make sure that we generated the exact same token so that we can access our remote encryption. So save this somewhere secure when you're creating it because while you don't need to use it unless you have to recreate your R clone file, you want to have it in case you have to recreate your R clone file. All right, so let's uh, go into our Google Drive because we should have a folder there now that is called crypt. So drive.google.com. Okay, it looks like there's nothing there. Let's copy something into it. Maybe then it will create the actual remote share. Maybe we have to create the folder by hand. I'm not positive. So let's do a CD and we're going to say, uh, what do we have in our, we have our pictures folder. So I'm going to say R clone copy pictures cbt gold and i want to copy that to crypt colon because that's the name of our new share so i want to copy that over now r clone ls crypt colon okay so if we do this we're going to see it's called cbt gold over here but if we come over here look at that there's a folder now the first time we accessed it it created the folder and it's called crypt but if we go inside crypt we can see there's a file, but look at that. The file is named some random string and there's no way to know what this file is. It's really, really awesome. It's encrypted on the fly. But when we look over here, as long as we have the correct credentials in our rclone.com file, we see it as a regular share. And that's, you use it just like a regular share with rclone, except instead of referring to Bob Drive, you refer to crypt and it's going to act, act just like a remote share where we have full access to the names, we can copy, we can move, we can sync. However, in the remote computer or in the remote web-based thing, nobody can read it on our drive itself, which means that it's completely secure. Nobody in our business is going to access our files and know what they are or even what they're named because everything is encrypted. So setting up encryption on the fly is super easy. And once it's set up and installed, when you access the remote share that you set up, again, ours was named Crypt, it acts just like an unencrypted remote in that it, all the encryption happens on the fly. So you don't have to worry about like uh, encrypting and decrypting and encrypting and decrypting because our clone does all the work for you. You just treat it like any other remote share and on the remote side, everything is encrypted. It's really exciting. I encourage you to use it because it's super powerful. Just remember to save those passwords because if you have to recreate your rclone.com 
comp file, you're going to need those original passwords or you're going to lose access to all of those encrypted files in your share. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. So we've set up our clone. We know how awesome it is. We can copy things back and forth from remote shares. Uh, we can encrypt it remotely so that people can't peek at what our files are. If they have access to our drive remotely, all the stuff is encrypted, but we have access to it locally. The last step is what just puts the magic into our clone. You can create a local mount of your remote share so you don't have to use command line tools to copy things back and forth. It's just like it's a local locally mounted share and you can copy files back and forth from it so you literally have a local folder on your computer that is unlimited in space or limited to however much storage you have available on google drive or amazon or whatever it is you're using for your remote storage it's just like a local share and like with everything else in our clone it's just a simple one line command to mount an our clone share right on your local linux system it's just incredible Using our clone, you have, of course, on your system, you already have like your home directory, your bin directory, your mount directory. If you use our clone, you can have a folder on your system. We're going to call it crypt because that's what our remote share is. And your remote files are going to sit on your local file system, just like every other file on your computer. It's just, it's so cool. And so here on Ubuntu, we have our, our stuff set up just like we did before. We have our crypt set up so that it's uh, encrypted remotely on our Google Drive, but we can access it locally. Um, I'm going to, first of all, install the Fuse uh, file system. We have to do that because it, it relies on Fuse in order to uh, mount the remote thing locally. So first of all, we're going to have to say sudo apt install Fuse. And this is just a one-time thing. I have to make sure it's installed. It might already be installed on your system. Here it's already installed on my system. Uh, but if it's not, that's what you need to do. Install Fuse. And then let's do a quick R, or quick ls. So our clone ls crypt colon, just so we can see what is in our remotely crypted file. We have that CBT gold file. So that's over there on our system. Now I'm going to say ls. I want to create a folder inside my home directory called crypt. Okay, so... I have a folder called crypt right there. And now I'm going to mount this remote share on my local com computer in this crypt folder. All I have to do is type our clone mount. Now I'm going to do daemon so that it goes in the background. So daemon mode crypt for the remote. That's what I want. The remote file is crypt and I want it to be mounted to home bob crypt. Press enter. I don't need to do any passwords. Remember, it's all stored in our, our, or our clone.com file. And now check this out. Are you ready? LS crypt. Boom. There's my file. It's so cool. I can go into, uh, I can go into it just like any other folder. So CD crypt, uh, here's a file. I can say touch test.txt. And it takes a little bit of while because actually it's, it's ask, accessing it remotely. It is not doing anything locally on my computer. Everything that we do is done remotely. So this test.txt file does not exist on my local file system. It only exists in Google Drive encrypted, right? I could do things like um, I can copy var log syslog uh, to syslog.txt. And it's going to copy my syslog here going to be right there. Now, check this out. If we come on over to Google Drive, look at this. All of these things inside my crypt folder are completely encrypted. Nobody knows what they are, but you and I know what they are because we just copied them there. They're encrypted on the remote drive, but right here, they're easily accessible as a local drive. And if we do DF minus H to see like how much space we have available on our file systems, look at this. Our crypt file system 15 gigabytes available. Again, if we were using our, uh, like a work account, we would have unlimited. It would actually say like 1.1 petabytes, uh, but 15 gigs available, 29 megabytes used in home Bob crypt. It's just that easy to mount it locally. Now, when you do mount it locally, there are ways you can do it automatically on boot. You can do something like system D and have it mounted automatically with system D. You can actually just do it with your cron tab and have it mount automatically on boot using cron tab. There's so many ways you can do it. It's just a one line command that will mount it on your system. It's that easy. And then when you mount your remote R clone share locally, it allows you to use it like unlimited file space on your local file system on your Linux box. It's just the coolest thing ever. I hope you utilize it. I hope you give it a try. And ultimately, I hope this has been informative for you. And I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi, guys. My name is Trevor Sullivan, a software instructor with CBT Nuggets. 
Welcome to this skill where we're going to be exploring a open source software utility called Tmux. Now Tmux itself is short for terminal multiplexer, and that's kind of a mouthful, right? What exactly does it mean to be a terminal multiplexer? Well, let's start by thinking about what a typical remote management scenario might look like. So you've got a server, could be running up in the cloud, could be running in an on-premises data center on a hypervisor like VMware or Hyper-V, for example. And in order to remotely manage that virtual machine, typically what you'll do is you'll fire up your terminal and you will issue an SSH command and you will remotely log into that server. Now, once you SSH into that server, you typically get a shell prompt, you know, most commonly something like bash, or if you're running a lightweight Linux distribution like Alpine Linux, you might get ASH as a default shell. Or maybe you've gone further and installed a third party shell like ZSH and configured that to be your default shell. Regardless of what shell you're using, typically you just have a single shell in front of you and you are kind of limited to only running a single command at a time. So what Tmux or this terminal multiplexer does is it allows you to split your session into not just one terminal, but multiple terminal sessions, and you can actually run lots of different commands in parallel. So imagine for a moment with me that you are a software developer. And as a software developer, let's say you're building a web application and you need to be able to spin up that web application. And then at the same time, when you run that web application software, you also need to be able to monitor some log files to look for errors or warnings in your code. And you also want to run a, another terminal session where you are displaying some maybe some data from a time series database, and you want to be able to graph that in a time series type of view. Well, if you are this type of software developer and you only have a single terminal session available to you, then you'd have to start your web server software, and then you'd have to either stop it or put it into the background and then spin up a command to monitor your log file. Well, as that interactive command is running to monitor your log file, you'd also need to be able to spin up another command to create a terminal-based dashboard that starts graphing data from a time series database. So very quickly, you can see how it becomes a challenge as a software developer to have only a single terminal available to you. Tmux can help to solve this problem by splitting your terminal session into multiple terminal sessions. Now, this it allows you to run multiple commands all at the same time. However, it also has an additional kind of fringe benefit, which is that it makes really good use of your screen real estate. Now, if you're like me, I only have a single monitor here, but it's running a 4K resolution. So I can actually fit a lot of data onto a single screen. And oftentimes when I'm running an application, things that are off to the right hand side or perhaps the top right hand side of the screen don't really have a lot of value. There's a lot of kind of empty screen real estate that isn't being utilized by various applications. So thanks to Tmux, you can actually split your terminal session into multiple terminal sessions that are all being displayed on the same screen at the same time, and you can make better use of the pixels that you have available to you on your screen. Now, Tmux is an open source application that's been around for a long time, and some similar competing utilities to that might be something like GNU's screen utility. And because Tmux is an open source project, that means that you can file issues on the project. So if you encounter a bug, something isn't quite working the way that you're expecting it to, you can actually file feedback for that particular project in the hopes that either the original author or perhaps a third party community member to that project can contribute a patch and fix that particular bug. Additionally, if there's some kind of feature that you would like to see in Tmux, then you can certainly submit that as a feature request on the open source project as well. And again, hopefully someone will come along and see that and see some value in that feature request and hopefully write the actual code to implement it for you. Now, Tmux works really well on its own as a terminal multiplexer so that you can run different built-in software utilities in the Linux operating system However, there are some additional utilities that can provide some additional value as well. For example, there's a couple of utilities. One is called Sampler. It's an open source utility. Another is called WTF, which is short for a terminal-based dashboard utility. 
And there's another one that is called Multitail. And these are some tools that you might see value in using alongside Tmux itself to provide a better experience. For example, Sampler and WTF are both terminal-based dashboard utilities that allow you to create dashboards that contain things like time series data, or maybe a widget with a weather report, or pretty much whatever data you want to display on that particular dashboard. So because a dashboard is typically a read-only type of widget, you can put that dashboard onto one side of the screen with Tmux, while on the other side of the screen, you're actually running interactive commands to either debug or manage your system. Another kind of cool fringe feature of Tmux is the ability to connect multiple Tmux clients to the same Tmux server process across a socket. So what this allows you to do is actually to share a Tmux environment so that if you're doing something like pair programming, where you have two teammates who are working on the same code base at the same time, you can actually share out your Tmux session so that somebody else, an observer, can actually see what you are coding or what you're testing in real time in the same Tmux session. In the remainder of this skill, we're going to take a look at how to get Tmux installed on your system using things like Docker, as well as common Linux distributions like Ubuntu Linux. And we're also going to take a look at how to customize Tmux. So one of the really cool things about Tmux is that it's very customizable. You can put pretty much anything that you want to inside your configuration file and change things like key bindings. You can add custom information on the status bar and a whole bunch of other stuff like that. We're also going to be exploring how you can manage sessions, windows, and panes inside of Tmux to maximize your productivity. Also, even though Tmux is primarily a terminal utility, it does support limited support for things like mouse movements as well. So we'll be taking a look at some of those features. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi guys, and welcome back. For starters, let's take a look at some different ways that you can install Tmux on your system. Now, do be aware that Tmux is a Unix utility. It doesn't run natively on the Microsoft Windows platform. So that being said, I am actually going to be demoing this on Windows. However, in order to run Tmux, there are a few different options that we can take a look at. For starters, the first and probably easiest way, in my opinion, is to install Docker Desktop. And Docker Desktop has a lot of different use cases, honestly, but I personally find that this is the easiest way to run a lot of different Linux software, regardless of what it may be. If you install Docker Desktop, what it actually does is it spins up a Linux virtual machine using the Microsoft Hyper-V hypervisor and it connects the Docker, da the Docker client rather to the Docker daemon that is running on that Linux system. So you can actually do things like Docker PS from a Windows environment, and it's actually running those commands on a Linux virtual machine. Now, if you would rather not use Docker, another way to get Tmux running on the Windows operating system, kind of, so to speak, is to actually use something called the Windows subsystem for Linux. So if you follow the Microsoft documentation for how to install the Windows subsystem for Linux, you can then launch a bunch of different Linux distributions from the Microsoft store on your Windows machine. So if you go over to the Microsoft Windows store, for example, you can see that there are Linux distributions for things like Ubuntu, Debian Linux, there's even a Fedora Remix, for example. There's Kali Linux, and there's a whole bunch of different Linux distributions that you can select from out there on the Microsoft Store. So this is actually the approach that I'm going to be using for the remainder of this video skill. So as you can see here under the Microsoft Terminal, I can actually launch, if I hit Control-Shift-P and search for New Tab, I can actually launch an Ubuntu shell right here natively on my Windows desktop system. This is actually running Ubuntu Linux. However, you can install multiple Linux distributions as well. And the third and final mechanism that I wanted to show you, which you can use to run Tmux on a Linux VM on Windows 10, is to use a canonical tool, the makers of Ubuntu Linux, 
called MultiPass. So MultiPass is an open source utility that allows you to very rapidly spin up Linux virtual machines on Hyper-V on Windows, or if you're on Mac, it actually uses the XHive hypervisor under the covers. So basically what that allows you to do is to come back to your terminal here and using a command like multipass shell, you can actually just very easily spin up an Ubuntu Linux virtual machine using the local hypervisor and it will connect your local terminal to that virtual machine. So those are three different ways that you can really easily get uh, Tmux up and running on a Windows system if you don't have it. Now, if you are going to go the Docker route, I did just want to quickly show you how you can create a container using Docker Desktop. So what we'll do is actually spin up a, an Ubuntu container. So I'll do docker run dash dash rm dash it to make it interactive. And then we'll just specify the Ubuntu image. And so what this does is it basically creates a new Linux container running. In this case, it's actually using the WSL backend. But if you choose the default option, it's actually to use the Hyper-V backend. You can actually have a, a, a choice there of which backend you want to use with Docker Desktop. But now that I'm running a new container, I basically have an Ubuntu environment available to me inside this container. So I can do something like apt update and that will update my package cache. And then once the package cache has been updated, then I can do an apt-get install on Tmux to install the utility. Great, so now we can run apt-get install tmux dash dash yes. And because we're running inside of a containerized environment as root, we don't have to worry about specifying the sudo utility in front to elevate our permissions. We just automatically have permission to install software inside this container. So as you can see, installing tmux is actually really fast. It's a very small utility. And if you just launch the tmux binary, that will get you into the tmux environment. I'll just exit out of there. And very similarly, because I am running Ubuntu Linux inside of the Windows subsystem for Linux environment, in this case, I am actually running a Ubuntu virtual machine inside of WSL. So we do have to specify sudo in order to elevate our permissions. But very similarly, you can just do an apt-get install on tmux, and that will go ahead and install the utility. And then if you just run tmux here, sure enough, we get a tmux prompt. So now that you've learned how to get Tmux up and running on your system, let's go ahead and explore some of the basics about the Tmux environment. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi guys, and welcome back. Now that you understand how to get Tmux installed in your preferred Linux environment, let's take a look at the basic structure of the utility. If you'd like to follow along, I actually have a GitHub repository over at github.com slash cbttrevor. The name of the repository is tmux-intro, so feel free to clone that if you'd like to follow along with my notes for this CBT Nuggets video skill. So the first thing that I wanted to call your attention to is that tmux has what's called a prefix key. So a lot of the functions in Tmux are actually performed using different keyboard shortcuts. And we're going to be learning some of the defaults. And we're also going to take a look at how you can customize some of the keyboard shortcuts later on as well. So the default keyboard shortcut for the prefix key in Tmux is the control B shortcut. So let's go ahead and switch over to our terminal environment and take a look at how this works. So if I just hit control B here, nothing really happens. We have to press another key after we press the prefix key in order to actually invoke one of the tmux commands. So one of those commands is actually the question mark. So if I hit shift and then forward slash on my US keyboard, I actually get the built-in help for tmux. Now, in order to navigate the built-in key bindings, anytime that you are in this copy mode, you can actually use the page up and page down keys to scroll through the different windows here. And so basically we can see that down here we have this section called prefix. And so basically all of these are going to be, all of these key bindings that we can see here are the default key bindings for Tmux. So anytime that you are not really sure which command to use inside of Tmux, you'll probably want to keep the control B followed by the question mark in mind 
so that you can always refer back to the actual key bindings in Tmux and look up the correct key binding for the sequence that you want to run. Now, in some cases, there may not be a default key binding, or maybe you want to create something that's entirely custom, so you could actually create those in a configuration file as well, which we'll take a look at later on. Now, I'm just going to hit Q, and that will exit me out of that built-in help for Tmux. That'll bring us back to our terminal here, and I wanted to make sure that you understand some of the fundamentals behind how Tmux works. So when we launched Tmux, just using the Tmux command line here, we're presented with this terminal environment here, very similar to if we were to SSH into a remote server. However, you'll notice some things that are a little bit different here. First of all, down here on the bottom of the screen, we have this status bar here, which by default is a green background with a black font color. And that's actually customizable. So you can actually change the information that's presented on the status bar. And you can also change the colors that are used for both the foreground text as well as the background for the status bar as well, which we'll take a look at later on. For now, just understand that there is a status bar and it is customizable. Now, when we launch Tmux, we have basically this implied session in running in the background. So if I were to exit out here, you can see that Tmux, Tmux has actually exited as well. And so Tmux is a client server architecture. So when we run Tmux, it basically looks for an existing server. And because it sees there's no existing server there, it's actually going to create a new server process. And then it's going to connect our client to that server process so that we can then interact with it. So behind the scenes, there's actually something called a session, and that's basically your server process that's running, and you can connect multiple clients to that, which we'll take a look at later on. But for now, on the bottom left-hand side here, notice that we have a zero here, and what this zero indicates is basically that we have a window with an identifier of zero. So we have this session object on the outside, and that's the server process for Tmux. But then inside of that session, we can actually create one or more windows inside the session. Now, the other thing that you don't necessarily see here is that we have a pane here. So this entire thing that we have in front of us right here is a single pane inside of this window. And one of the cool things about Tmux is that you can actually take a window with a single pane and you can split it into multiple panes. In fact, that's how we can get better use of our screen real estate as we discussed in the very first video. So let's hit control B and then question mark. And then let's skip down past all these copy mode bindings. And we'll take a look at these prefix bindings here. And what you'll notice here is that there are some different shortcuts that allow you to split a window into multiple panes. So there's actually a default key binding here, which You'll have to forgive the backslash there, but it's actually just a double quote. So that's basically just the escape character for the double quote. But basically, we would hit the key prefix, which is control B. That's our default send prefix shortcut for Emux. And then following the prefix, we would actually specify a double quote, and that will allow us to split our window into multiple panes. So let me hit Q to return back to the terminal here, and then I'll do control B and then shift single quote, which gives me a double quote. And as you can see, that split our window horizontally. So now we have two different panes, one on the top and one on the bottom right here. So we still only have a single window, but we've split that window into two panes. Now, what if you wanted to make use of the right hand side of the screen instead? Well, what you can do is hit control B question mark and come back here to our key bindings. And if we tab down all the way to our prefix helpers here, you'll see that there's actually two different shortcuts by default to split your window. So there's split window, and then there's one called split window dash H here. So Tmux has a bunch of built-in commands inside of it. And so this default keyboard shortcut is actually just running this Tmux command called split window, and then it's passing a dash H argument to it. And the shortcut there is going to be, of course, our prefix, which is control B, followed by a percent sign. So let's go ahead and give that a try here. So I'll exit out of my secondary pane there, and then now I'm left with just one pane again. So if I do control B and then shift five to get a percent sign, oh look, now we've actually split it vertically instead. So now we actually have two different panes 
in the same window that are sitting side by side. So that's all pretty cool functionality. Now we've got two different panes here running two different completely separate shell environments. Now, what if you wanted to temporarily maximize one of these? So let's say that I had some uh, utility running in here, like tail var log star, and maybe I'll put a dash F in there just so to follow. And let's say that I wanted to get this log file expanded out to full screen, because as you can see by default right here, it's with this font size, it's actually crunching that text and it's causing line wrapping to occur. Well, there's another keyboard shortcut inside of Tmux called Control B and then Z, just lowercase z is fine for this one. And as you can see down by our window here, we have this Z pop up here, which is indicating that our window is currently in full screen mode. So basically what we've done is we still have these two panes inside of the same window, but we've temporarily maximized one of them so that we can better see the contents that's inside of that pane. Now, if you want to undo that, just use the same keyboard shortcut. I'll hit Control B and Z, and that returns us to our standard non full screen view. Now, going forward, we're going to explore windows and panes and even sessions in a lot more detail. But for the time being, the key takeaway from this video is that there is a session, which is basically your Tmux server, and then there are one or more windows inside of that session. And then inside of each window, you can actually split that into one or more panes, depending on your preference. Additionally, the other key takeaway here is that you can always remember the prefix question mark keyboard shortcut, and that will take you to the built-in Tmux help so that you, you can find out the correct keyboard shortcut for the command that you're trying to execute. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi guys, and welcome back. In the previous video, we took a look at some of the Tmux basics. So we basically fired up Tmux with no command line arguments, and we launched the utility and kind of learned about some of the basics. However, Tmux does actually support a series of command line arguments. Now, anytime that you want to learn about the command line arguments for Tmux, you can always run man Tmux, or if you'd prefer a web browsable version of the man page for Tmux, oftentimes the Ubuntu documentation actually has a really good format of that. So in this video, I wanted to take a look at some of the command line options for Tmux that you can use to customize the environment depending on your specific needs. So here we are over in the Ubuntu product documentation here. Now, one of the things I do want to stress is that there have been some major breaking changes in Tmux. So when you're taking a look at the documentation for Tmux, make sure that you are taking a look at the documentation version that corresponds to the version of Tmux that you are running. So if I were to switch over to my terminal environment here and run Tmux dash capital V, not lowercase v, which has a different meaning, but Tmux dash capital V, and you'll get back the version of Tmux that you're running. And in this case, it looks like I'm running Tmux version 3.0 A. So if we switch back over here, it looks like this documentation is for 3.0 A-2, which is probably close enough. At least it's not like 2.1 or 2.0 or anything like that. So this version of the documentation should correspond pretty closely to the version that I'm running in my shell there. So as you can see, the Tmux command line options are pretty slim here. There's just a couple of key ones that I wanted to talk through here. Of course, first of all, make sure that you know the dash capital V option because that is going to tell you on any given system what version of Tmux you're running. If you're trying to customize Tmux or maybe you're trying to run a particular key binding or run a specific Tmux command and it's not working properly, it's quite possible that you're running a different version of Tmux that has one of those breaking changes from what you're accustomed to. Now, something else I wanted to call out as well is that you can actually customize the Unix socket path of Tmux. So by default, Tmux creates a server socket under the slash temp directory, and the name of it is default. So if you would like to either customize the Unix socket name, or if you want to spin up multiple sockets for Tmux, which are running in totally separate separate processes, then you can actually do that by specifying a custom socket name using the tmux-l parameter. And that's capital L, by the way. So back here in our terminal, if we do tmux-l, let's say Trevor, 
The only real difference is that we have created a socket for tmux called Trevor instead of default. So let's take a look at the temp directory, and you'll see there's a folder in there called tmux-1000. So let's actually do an ls-lga on slash temp slash tmux1000. And as you can see in the terminal output here, sure enough, we do have that default socket that was created in a previous session. There's also a test socket that I had created in a previous session as well. And right here at 2.34 p.m., we have this Trevor socket as well. So that basically just allows you to customize the socket name if you are running multiple terminal tmux sessions rather on different listeners. So let's switch back over to the documentation here. And if you would like to specify a custom path for that particular tmux socket, then you can actually do that using the dash capital S parameter. So the dash capital L parameter allows you to change the name of the socket, but it actually stays in the same directory as all of the other sockets. If you want to change the path to the socket, you can actually do that using dash capital S. A little bit later on in a different video, we're going to explore customizing tmux quite a bit further. However, keep in mind that if you want to specify a custom file path to a tmux configuration file, then you can do that using the dash f parameter. So by default, it's going to actually look in your home directory under .tmux.conf, so that's a hidden file. And then it's also going to look for the system level configuration at etsy tmux.conf. So if you don't want to use those configuration files, then you can actually override that by using the dash F parameter. Those are pretty much the key parameters that you'll need to know about tmux. Pretty much everything else in tmux is either done inside of tmux itself or as part of the tmux configuration file that we just talked about. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi guys and welcome back. In a previous video we talked a little bit about the basic architecture of tmux, how it's a client server architecture. You can customize where which socket the server process is listening on so you can actually create multiple tmux servers. You can also have multiple tmux sessions, windows, and panes as well. And in each tmux session you can actually connect more than one client to the same session. So in this video, we're going to take a deeper look at how to manage servers and sessions inside of tmux. Let's jump in. All right, so here I am back in my Windows subsystem for Linux terminal, and I'm going to go ahead and start by just typing tmux. And so that's going to bring us back into the default tmux configuration, which basically just gives us a single session. So now if I run tmux ls, you'll notice that we have a single session available here. You can also do the full command name, which is tmux list session. And that will show you the exact same information. And in fact, you can even see that there's a client attached to this particular session here. So what if I wanted to create a new session? Well, what I can do is actually detach my client from the session, but actually leave it in a running state. And to do that, what you can do is use control B and then question mark. Again, this is going to take us back to the built-in help that shows us all of the different keyboard shortcuts that are built in here. And what we're going to be doing is looking for the detach command. So as you can see here, right here, we've got the prefix and then lowercase d, and that will issue a tmux command called detach-client. So I'll hit Q to come back to the terminal session here, and then I'll do control B and then D. Now what you'll see is that we get this message printed to our terminal here saying that we detached from session number zero in the tmux server process. So now I'm back in my, outside of tmux and I'm actually back into my standard shell environment. So what I can do is run tmux ls or list session and that'll show me all of the sessions. But you'll see that the attached text is no longer appearing, appearing because we are not attached to that particular session. However, there is session ID 0 with one window inside of it. So if you would like to reattach to that running session in the background, you can run tmux at, and that's basically just very short and abbreviated form of attach to a session. Now if you're ever unsure about the different tmux commands that are available, be sure to go out to the man page for tmux to search for all the different commands. So let's actually just do man tmux here, 
And then if we just kind of tab down using the page down key, we can search for all of the different commands. So right here under the clients and sessions heading, you can see all of the different commands that are related to managing sessions in Tmux. So the command that we just used to reattach to the running session that we initially detached from is the attach session command. And then we also used the detach client command to actually disconnect our client, our Tmux client, from the server process, but leave the Tmux server running. So the nice thing about this is that if we were running a process such as, let's say, a tail command that's monitoring a log file, or maybe we are running a web server process that we need to debug a web application locally here on our dev system, that would actually stay running inside of that Tmux session even though we detached our client from it. So this is really a handy utility. Now you can see some other commands here that allow us to manage the server process as well as the individual sessions that are running on the server. So we can actually kill the entire Tmux server using the kill server command, and we can actually kill a specific session by using the kill session command. We can also see the clients that are attached to a particular session by listing those clients out. So let's go ahead and check out how we can create multiple sessions here. So let's go ahead and detach from our current session because we're inside of a session right now. So I'll do control B and then lowercase d. And then just to confirm that that session is still running on the server process, I'll just do a tmux ls, which is short for list session. And what I want to do now is actually create a new session. So tmux has a new session command that allows us to do exactly that. So if I run tmux new session, we are now in a completely different session as indicated down here on the lower left hand side, which now has a one instead of a zero. So we are in window zero in tmux session number one. So if I hit control B and then D to detach from our new session number one, I can now connect back to a specific session by using tmux attach session. And then if I take a look at the help for this using dash dash help, I can specify the dash T parameter that allows me to specify a specific session that I would like to connect to. So let's do tmux ls to take a look at the running sessions here. And so I've got a session zero and I've got a session one. So if I want to reconnect back to session zero, I can do tmux attach session and dash T and then zero. And that will bring us back into session zero in our server process. Now, thanks to the client server architecture in Tmux, one of the cool things that you can do, as we discussed in an earlier video, is something like pair programming, or maybe you're even like a team of operations people and you've got two different operations people who are trying to explore a specific system issue and they both want to be looking at the same data at the same time. So what you can actually do is share out Tmux so that somebody can remotely connect to it. So if you, both users were logged on to the same server and had access to the same socket, then they would both be able to attach their Tmux client to that particular process. So what I'm going to do here is actually leave this one running, but I'm actually going to open up a separate window inside of Windows Terminal here. And I'm going to go ahead and fire up my Windows subsystem for Linux distribution. And let's just go ahead and do a Tmux LS here. Sure enough, because we're using the default socket where we haven't changed the socket name, I can see all of the sessions that are available on the default Tmux server process. So even though I'm logged in as the same user, we're basically emulating as if I was logged in as a different user account. So now what I'm going to do is actually attach to the same session that this person here in this window is attached to. So I'll do Tmux attach session dash T zero. And check out what happened here. Notice how the screen in the background has actually changed a little bit. And as I resize this window here, you can actually see the window in the background changing in real time. So basically what's happening here is Tmux is able to see that we have two different clients connected that have two completely different dimensions because they're running into, inside of two different terminal windows. And so what Tmux is doing is it's basically choosing the least common denominator and it's basically saying, OK, this window here that I have open on the top is actually smaller in size in, in the number of characters wide and the characters tall than the other client that's connected to the same session. 
So in order for both of those clients to see the same data, they both need to be sized the exact same. And so what basically Tmux is doing here is it's resizing the larger client to the size of the smaller client so that they can both see the same amount of data. And all of these dots that you see here in this extra dead space are exactly that. It's just basically dead space that isn't actually being used by Tmux. So now if I were to split the window here using control B and then percent sign, you can actually see that both clients are being rendered at the dimensions of the smallest client connected to the same session. Now, one of the other cool things about Tmux is that if you would like to disconnect other clients that are connected, so let's say I no longer have access to this terminal here where client number one is connected and I want to basically disconnect client number one, what I can do is go to client number two here and I can do something like exit. Let's get us back to just a single shell session here. And now what I can do is run Tmux list clients and you can see all of the clients that are connected to this session. And I can see that this client here is the larger of the two. So I wanna get rid of this larger one that's running inside of the background, 105 characters wide by 29 characters tall. So what I can do is actually run tmux detach client dash dash help and take a look at the parameters that I need to specify in order to detach one of the clients. And sure enough here, I can specify dash T and specify a target client. And then I can pass in the client ID right here. So I'll run tmux detach client dash T and then specify dev PTS slash one. And sure enough, as you can see right there in the background, that client number one is disconnected. And if I do tmux list clients again, I now only have the seven client connected to the session. So using client number seven here, I can go ahead and just do control B D to detach again, do a tmux ls, sorry, tmux ls there, and list out all of the sessions that are running on that default server socket. And now I can go ahead and connect over to session number one. So as you can see, tmux is incredibly versatile. I can create multiple sessions, I can connect multiple clients to those sessions, and I can also destroy sessions as well. So there's actually a kill session command that allows us to manage sessions. So let's do control B and then D to detach, do a tmux ls. Sure enough, I still have these two sessions running. And let's say at this point that I'm done with session number one and I want to destroy that particular session while leaving session zero running. What I can do is run tmux kill session and then take a look at the help for it. And as you can see, consistent with other tmux commands, there's a dash t argument that allows me to specify which session exactly I want to kill. So I'll go ahead and do tmux dash dash kill session dash t zero. And now if I do a tmux ls, you can see that I am left with just a single session remaining. If managing a bunch of different sessions by their unique identifiers that are generated by the operating system seems a little bit uh, precarious, then you'll, you'll be thankful to know that you can actually create your own custom session names as well. So thankfully, tmux has a built-in command called tmux rename session. And so what you can see here is that we can use the dash T parameter to specify which session we want to rename. And then following that, we can provide a new name for the session. So we are currently not connected to tmux. I'm just in my standard shell environment here. And if I run tmux rename session dash T one, because we only have a single session remaining, and then let's rename that to something like CBT nuggets. And then we'll do a tmux LS. And as you can see, we've actually renamed our session from being session number one to actually having a proper name that we can then very easily manage using a proper name instead of a unique identifier. Now, if you're completely done with tmux and you would like to kill off all sessions within the particular server, there is actually a tmux kill server command as well. And if you run that, it's going to just, of course, use the default socket. Or if you're running tmux on an alternative named socket, or a different path using the dash s parameter for tmux, then you could optionally specify that as well. But if we just run tmux kill server, it's gonna go ahead and kill the server that's using that default tmux socket. As you can see, there's a lot of power in tmux in being able to run multiple servers, multiple sessions, and connect multiple clients to the same session to share information between them. 
I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi guys, and welcome back. In the previous video, we took a look at how you can manage multiple sessions and connect multiple clients to a Tmux server. In this video, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into window and pane management inside of a single Tmux session so that you can get a better understanding of how to organize all of the work that you're doing inside of the Tmux utility. Let's jump in. All right, so here we are back in our Windows subsystem for Linux here, and I'm just going to go ahead and fire up a new Tmux session. Now, by default, we just have a single Tmux session. We have a window and we have a single pane. So down here in the bottom left, we have zero, which is our session ID. We have zero here, which is our window identifier. And then we basically just have a single pane inside of the window. Now, as we looked at in a previous video, if we hit control B and then let's say percent sign, we can actually split vertically the window so that we now have two different panes. So for reference, I'm because both of these terminals are the same, they look the same right now, they're basically just a bash prompt, I'm going to go ahead and run a command so that we can have some content here. So I'll just do tail-f var log star dot log. So now I have one pane that's got some log information, and then maybe over here I want to keep this one for interactive utilization. Now let's say that I'm not happy with this window setup, and I basically want to swap these panes so that my log file is on the left, and then my interactive prompt is on the right. Well, what I can actually do is swap these two panes by using the swap pane command. Now, inside of Tmux, if you want to run a command inside of your environment, you can actually use a shortcut called Control B and then Shift semicolon, which actually gives you a colon. And as you'll notice down here, my status bar actually changes into this interactive command prompt that I can now type a command in. Now, I'm just going to hit escape here really quick, and I want to hit a different shortcut that, that's going to pop up really quickly and then disappear. So if I hit Control B and then Q, Notice how it actually pops open. I'm just going to do that again here. Notice how it pops open this overlay on top of each of these panes, and it shows me a 0 and a 1. So basically, I have pane 0 and pane 1. So even though it's not obvious from the status bar, I actually do have pane identifiers 0 and 1 here, and it's also showing me the character dimensions of the panes as well up here in the top right corner of each of those two panes. So now what I'm going to do is hit control B and then colon, and then I'm going to come back to my prompt down here in the bottom, and I'm going to type a command called swap pane. Now you'll notice that that doesn't do anything by default. So what I actually need to do is specify a source and a target pane that I want to swap. So what I'll do is go back to the command prompt using control B colon, and then I'll run swap dash P. And then if I hit tab, you'll see that I actually get auto completion here. What I don't get auto completion for are the arguments to the command. So basically you need to specify the dash s parameter which allows you to specify the source pane. So I'm just going to choose either 0 or 1 here because we're only swapping two panes. And then I'll choose the target of 1. So basically I'm saying 0 goes to 1 and 1 goes to 0. So what that's going to do when I hit enter is effectively just swap those two panes so that they are now in a reversed fashion. So now my interactive prompt is over here on the right hand side of the screen and my log is on the left hand side. Now let's say that I wanted to resize one of these panes. So right now they are taking up an equal amount of space on each side of the screen. However, what if I wanted to expand my logs so that it's maybe five characters wider than it currently is? Well, if I go back to the command prompt here in Tmux using control B colon, there is actually another command called resize pane. So you can see I can tab complete it there. And then there are a few different characters or arguments rather that you can choose. So you can use up, down, left, and right. And you just want to use the capital character for each of those. So let's say that I want to resize this pane to the right five cells. I can do that by using dash capital R and then five. And as you'll see, it actually expanded my log pane five characters to the right hand side and my interactive prompt has actually shrunk as a result. 
Now, just a few moments ago, we were using Control B and then Q to pop open the pane identifiers. So I've just got zero and one here. So right now I am actually on pane zero, as you can see by the flashing cursor on the lower left. But if I want to jump over to my interactive prompt, I can actually do Control B, Q, and then one. Now you wanna make sure that you hit that one very quickly because if you don't and the overlay disappears, then that keyboard shortcut is essentially invalid and you'll just keep typing in the shell that you are currently inside of. So just keep that in mind as well. That's a really nice way to just kind of jump around between panes is to use Control B Q followed by the number of the pane that you want to work with. Now, something else that's really cool is that if you wanted to create a completely separate window with its own set of panes, you can actually do that as well. So to create a new window, you'll use Control-B followed by C. And as you can see on the bottom status bar here, we now have two windows. We have window ID 0 and window ID 1, and the star is indicating the window that we are currently managing. Now, if you would like to change the window that you currently have selected, so if I want to jump back to window number zero, I can do that by hitting control B and then W short for window. And this is really cool because it actually gives you an interactive view of your windows along with a preview of those windows as well. So up here at the very top, and I'm just using the arrow keys to navigate this, by the way, you can see at the very top here, we actually have our session ID, which is session zero for Tmux. And inside of that session, we have this kind of tree view that shows us that we have two windows, window ID 0 and window ID 1. And then drilling further into that, it actually shows me the number of panes that are available on each window. And as I use the arrow keys to navigate through them, it's actually giving me this nice real-time preview here on the bottom of the pane layout, as well as the actual content of each of those panes inside the window. So if I want to jump back to window zero, I can just select window zero here and hit enter and it'll bring me back to that particular window. One of the nice things about windows as well is that you can rename them just like you can do with sessions. So the keyboard shortcut to rename a window by default is control B and then comma. And as you'll notice down here in my status bar, I have this rename window command. And if I just hit backspace to remove the default window name, I can actually go ahead and just type a custom name, like maybe I'll call it logs, for example. So maybe I want a bunch of logs to appear inside of this particular window. And then if I hit control B W and switch back to window number one, I can now rename this window to something else like control B comma, and we'll name this interactive. So now I have some nice window names that are associated with each of my windows so that I can more easily navigate to them as I am browsing through the list of them. If you would prefer to navigate a little bit more quickly through your windows instead of using the interactive tree view, you can actually just use control B and then zero or control B one and use the numbers or the indexes of these windows to switch between them a little bit more rapidly than you can using the tree view. If you have a window open and you would like to close that window or kill that window, there is a default keyboard shortcut binding for that as well. So if you hit control B and then shift seven for ampersand, you can see that we're prompted down here in the status bar to say, do you want to kill window named logs? And if you hit yes or Y for yes, then it'll go ahead and kill that window. And we're left with just one window. But what you'll notice is that the window ID that was assigned when it was created is actually going to stay with it. So even though we only have one window and we killed window zero, we actually still have window one available to us. So it actually hasn't decreased that identifier. Now, if you do want to change window order, let's say that maybe I hit control B C several times here. So now you can see I've actually got zero, one, two, and three. So now let's say that I wanted to move my interactive window, which is currently index one, and let's say I wanted to move it to the end. Well, what I could do is actually hit control B and then period, and this will issue the move dash window command in Tmux. And then you can type a number where you want it to place it in the index. And so basically I'm just going to replace index one with index four instead. Or actually, let me switch over to Hit control B1, that'll switch me over to interactive. And now that this is the interactive window, I can go ahead and hit control B period. 
and then hit, let's say, 5. And now my interactive shell is actually index 5. As you can see, managing windows and panes, as well as managing sessions, as well as Tmux servers themselves, gives you a ton of flexibility in terms of how you format your data inside of your Tmux sessions. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi guys and welcome back. In this video, we're going to take a look at how to customize some different features within Tmux. Now, Tmux configuration can be pretty complicated, but hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have at least a little bit better of an understanding of how that works. Now, the first thing to understand is where exactly on the file system Tmux loads its configurations from. The first file system location is a system-wide location that applies to any user that's logged into the system, and that's under slash etc slash tmux.conf. Now, most of your configuration you'll probably want to put into your per-user configuration within your user profile, and that would be under your home directory under a file in the root of your home called .tmux.conf. So what we're going to do is basically inject some custom configurations inside of .tmux.conf and hopefully you'll understand a little bit better about how to customize some of the environmental options. Now before we get into this, it's important to understand the four different levels of configuration options. And this actually maps to existing concepts that you already know and understand. First of all, there are server options, and then there are session level options, there are window level options, and fourth is pane level options. So depending on what feature it is that you're trying to customize within Tmux, it'll be in one of those four levels. So let's jump into our desktop here and take a look at how to do some basic customizations. All right, so for starters, what we're going to do is go ahead and modify this file called .tmux.conf inside of our user's home directory. And what we're going to be doing is focusing on a couple of commands here, one of which is called set option, and the other is called set window option, uh, which you can also abbreviate as set w. And set option in particular is a little bit unique because this allows you to apply settings to the server level, to the session level, there's also something called the global session. So you do set option dash G and that allows you to set certain global options. So let's go ahead and jump over here into Tmux <clears throat> for starters. I'm actually going to exit out of Tmux and just get back into a basic Windows subsystem for Linux shell environment. So now what I want to do is to basically just create a new file, vim home.tmux.conf. In fact, I think I already have a couple of things in here, but what we're going to do is just hit dd a few times and get rid of those. And now we basically just have an empty tmux configuration. So for starters, let's say we wanted to bind a custom keyboard shortcut. So maybe we want to add a custom key binding that allows us to create a new window. So one of the keys that is default unmapped in tmux is control B U. So let's say I want to use control B U instead of control B C, or maybe in addition to control B C, to create a new Tmux window. Well, let's go ahead and look at the documentation for Tmux here. This is the man page for it. And if you take a look at the options section here, it'll basically go through and describe the different types of options, the different levels they can be applied at, and things like that. <clears throat> and then if we scroll up just a little bit from there, there's also a key bindings heading in the man page that allows you to see how to create custom key bindings. Now, one of the kind of unique features within Tmux is something called a key table. And so anytime that you create a key binding using the bind key configuration option, the then you'll want to specify the key table so that your custom key binding is associated with a specific key table. Now, what exactly is a key table, you might ask? Well, if we switch back over to our terminal here, and I'm actually just going to write this file, launch tmux and hit control b question mark to come into the built-in help, you'll notice that we actually have these bind key commands with the dash t parameter, which allows us to specify the key table. So there is actually a key table called copy mode. And if we hit page down a couple of times, you'll see there's another key table called copy mode vi. And then if we keep scrolling down to where we were in an earlier video, you'll notice that there is a key table called prefix. 
And so the prefix key table is where we place all of the key bindings that we want to use along with a key prefix. If you use a key table called root, then that's actually going to bind directly to the key. So as soon as we hit the U key, it would actually trigger an action, but that's not what we want to happen. We only want the action to happen, the new window action in this case, to occur after we type the prefix followed by the keyboard shortcut. So what we need to do is to basically bind a key using the prefix key table, and then we need to specify the key that we want to bind after that. In this case, it's just going to be the letter U. And then finally, we need to specify the command that we want to invoke as a result of that key sequence being pressed. So let's go ahead and just hit Control C and exit out of there. We'll exit out of tmux as well. And then we'll open up our .tmux.conf file. And now we'll basically just follow that pattern that we just discussed, where we're going to run bind key, specify the key table of prefix, We'll do dash T prefix, and then we need to specify the character that we're going to use for the keyboard shortcut after the prefix is pressed. Again, the prefix being control B, in case that was unclear. And then finally, we need to specify the command in tmux that we want to invoke. And if you're looking for a list of commands in tmux, go back to the man page. You can see all of these commands up here. Uh, you know, switching windows, renaming windows, uh, pane management, session management, server management, all that stuff. It's all very well documented inside of the tmux man page. You just have to do a bit of scrolling to kind of get through it to figure out what you're looking for. So now we need to just specify the command here, which is new window, and we should be good to go. We should have a custom E binding available. So let's go ahead and hit escape colon WQ to write out our file, and then we will launch tmux. Now, nothing has changed in terms of our initial state, except that we have a new custom key binding here. So if I hit control B followed by U, check it out. We now have a custom key binding that has created a new window for us. Now, one of the other things that you can do as well is you can actually specify arguments to the tmux commands inside of the custom key binding. So let's say that we wanted control B U to actually kill a window with the specific name of logs, okay? So what we can do is just exit back out of here of tmux, just do exit a couple of times, and then I will do my vim command again. And then what I'm gonna do in this case is actually change new window to actually be kill window. And then if you recall, we can actually specify the dash T parameter to specify which window we want to kill, either based on its index or based on its name. So in this case, I want to kill a window with the name logs. That's our, that's our target. That's the dash T parameter there. So now I'll just save that file, pop open tmux again, and then hit control B U. And oh, look what's happening. We get this yellow kind of warning message in our status bar saying can't find window logs. And that's because we haven't created a window with the name logs. Right now we just have a window with the ID zero, and I believe its name is bash. So what we can do is create a new window. So I'll do control B C, and then I'll do control B comma to actually rename the window, and we'll rename it to logs. So now I'll just switch back to control B W, go back to my zero window. So now I'm back on window zero here, and I want to kill the logs window. And to do that, I'll just hit control B U, and sure enough, my keyboard shortcut binding did work correctly, and it killed the window with the name logs. So now if I hit control B U again, I'm not going to accidentally kill my current window because it's not named logs like the other window was. So that's just a really basic option of example of how you can customize your key bindings using the bind key command in your tmux configuration. Now there's a whole ton of other options as well that are available. So one of the things that you can do is from inside tmux, you can actually do tmux show options and then do dash s. So what this is going to do is actually show you a bunch of different global session options. So if we go back to the options documentation here, you can see that the tmux server has a set of global options which do not apply to any particular window or session or pane and these are altered with set option dash s or displayed with show options dash s so as you can see we just did tmux show options dash s and these are some of those global session options that are not specific to any particular session 
So these are things that you can set uh, globally. And so what we could do, for example, is set this option here called exit unattached. And this is kind of cool because this will actually cause sessions to quit as soon as clients are de completely detached from them. So in the default Tmux configuration, if we detach a client using control B D, then the session will actually stay running in the background. That's the default config. But if we wanted to change that, we could actually set this exit unattached option to quit the session as soon as all the clients are detached. So let's go ahead and try that out. So what I'll do is open up my emux.conf again in my home directory, and then I'll do set option dash s, and we will set exit dash unattached, and we'll set that to on. And if you were to scroll down just a little bit here, you would eventually see we've got server options here. We've got exit unattached, on or off. So basically those are the two options that we have. So I'll hit escape, hit colon WQ here. We'll fire up Tmux, and then I'll hit control B and then D to detach from the session. Now if I run Tmux LS, you'll see that that session exited and the server process has actually exited as well. So we have actually caused Tmux as a process, the server process, to quit as soon as all of the clients are detached from it. There's a bunch of other configuration options as well. So for example, if we were to scroll down a little bit here, unfortunately this particular man page formatting doesn't have headings for it just due to the Tmux man page formatting. However, there is a heading here kind of that shows available server options are as follows, X, Y, and Z. And if we were to keep scrolling, eventually you would see available session options are B, B, and C. And some of the options that we can set at the session level are things like enabling or disabling the status bar. So if we have the status option here, we can set that to off. So we can turn the status bar off. We can also turn it back on, or we can actually change the height of the status bar. So by default, the status bar, when it's on, has a height of 1. And if we want, we can actually increase that to anywhere from one through five, actually. So let's go ahead and try that out. So from inside Tmux here, because this is a session specific option, we actually need to be inside of a session to configure this. So what we can do is hit control B, colon, and that'll bring us into the command interactive command prompt here. And now what I'll do is set option, and then we'll type status, which is the option name that we want to change, and then instead of on, which it is by default here, I'll set it to off. So now we have a really clean prompt here. There's no status bar. In fact, you can barely even tell that we're inside of Tmux anymore. So let's say we wanted to increase the status bar height to 5. I'll hit Control B colon. And as you can see, sure enough, we are still in Tmux because my little interactive prompt came back up. And now I'll do set option status 5. And so what you can see has happened now is we've actually increased the height in characters in the terminal of our status bar. And so you can change that again anywhere from 1 to 5. Now, there are tons of other configuration options that you can set. For example, you can customize the foreground and background color of the status bar. Plus, you can even inject custom scripts that inject data onto the status bar if you would like as well. But that's beyond the scope of this particular training. I just wanted to kind of introduce the concept of these configuration options for Tmux. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi guys, so far in this skill, you've seen a lot of different powers in being able to control different sessions and windows and panes. Now, if you are manually creating your sessions, panes, and windows, and all those different types of utilities, then you might want to actually save a particular layout that you've created, and then very quickly be able to import or restore that particular state in a brand new session down the road. So let's say maybe you've got a single Tmux session, but you've got three different windows set up. One of them is named Logs, one of them is your web development, server and one of them is just an interactive terminal that you can use to control the system. Well, if you want to save that particular layout so that you don't have to recreate it every single time that you start Tmux, then there's actually a really cool open source companion utility 
called tmuxp that allows you to accomplish this. Let's take a look at it. So here we are on the tmuxp landing page, which is at tmuxp.git-pull.com. And it also has an open source GitHub repository here over at github.com slash tmuxpython slash tmuxp. And this project is very much up to date. It's being actively maintained. And one of the nice things about tmuxp is simply how easy it is to install. So provided that you have a working Python 3 installation on your Linux system, you can just run pip3 install tmuxp to get that installed on your system. Additionally, it gives you an example of what the configuration file looks like, but we're not actually going to create the configuration file by hand. What we're actually going to do is use one of the subcommands in tmuxp called freeze that will take our current session and it'll basically snapshot it and store it automatically in this YAML configuration for us on disk so that we can restore it later on. So let's switch over to our terminal now. And we'll go ahead and run pip3 install dash dash user tmuxp. Of course, I've already got it installed, so I should be able to just run tmuxp at the command line. Now, if for some reason you try to run tmuxp and you've installed it and it still is not detecting, then you might want to look in your home directories dot local slash bin directory, which is where user binaries are stored when you do pip3 install dash dash user. So as you can see over here on the right hand side, I've got tmuxp right here on my system. So you could always do home.local slash bin slash tmuxp, or you could simply add that directory home.local slash bin to your path environment variable so that your shell knows how to locate that command. So what we'll, what we'll do is just run tmuxp here. And as you can see, there are several different subcommands. And one of those subcommands within tmuxp is called freeze. So what freeze will do is it'll basically examine your running session configuration in tmux, and it will do its best to snapshot that into a YAML configuration file that you can then restore later on. So if you were to destroy your tmux server process and destroy that session and you want to start a fresh session and then restore that state with all the windows and panes laid out the way that they were before, we can do that by using freeze and then import to bring it back. So let's start by running tmux here. And I'll just create a couple windows. I'll do control B and then C to create a new window. And then I'll do control B and then comma to rename this window to logs. Then I'll do that again. I'll do control BC to create another window and I'll rename this one to web server. So basically the idea here is that my window zero, so control B W, the window zero would be used for kind of interactive type of stuff. This is where I can type commands and run, manage my system. And then window number one is going to kind of have this tail command running where we'll basically tail all of our logs. And then the idea with win window number two here is that that will be my web server. It'll basically run, you know, maybe npm run dev or something like that. Basically just run my server process so that I can then go back to window zero and do all my interactive work there. So this is a pretty cool setup. And as you can see, if I do control BW, I actually do have two different sessions here. I have session zero running and I also have session one running. So we need to make sure that we snapshot session ID one here. So let's go ahead and detach from our session. So control B and then D. And then if we do tmux ls, sure enough, there are the two sessions, each with several windows inside of them. So now what I need to do is basically freeze the configuration. So to do that, I can do tmux E and then freeze. And let's take a look at the help for this really quick. And as you can see, we can actually specify a session name here. So I'm just going to specify the session name, which is basically just one right now. I'll do tmux p, tmux p freeze one. And then it'll ask you if you want to use YAML or JSON. And then it'll say, yes, do you want to save this config? And then you want, where do you want to save it on the file system? So I'll go ahead and just save it to the default location. And actually, let me restart that here really quick. So YAML, yes. And then we'll just hit enter for the default file name and then we'll hit yes, we want to save that. 
Great. So now inside of our tmux p directory in our home directory, we have a couple of different files here. So this is the one that I created as a test earlier, and this one file is the one that we just created right now. So let's cat that file really quick and take a look at the format. So as you can see here, we've got our session ID up here, and then we've got uh, Windows, which is an array of Windows, and then we've also got panes as well. And you can see that it actually saved the shell command tail, albeit not with all of the parameters that I passed into it, but it does know that we were running tail inside of that logs window. So now let's go ahead and kill off our tmux server so that we can start from a blank slate again. So I'll do tmux kill server and then tmux ls just to make sure that it is not actually running. So what we want to do is actually use the load command, not the import command. The import command has a different uh, purpose. But we want, what we want to do is use tmux p load and then this will allow us to specify the configuration file and by default it's going to look in that .tmux p directory for our configuration. So basically all we need to do is specify the name of the configuration file. You don't have to worry about specifying the file suffix. You can literally just do tmux p load and then one. And that will actually restore our tmux configuration for that session back to where it was before. So as you can see, we've got three windows here. Let me just hit control B W to go to our window selector. We've got three windows. We have our interactive bash terminal here. And then we've got the logs window where we have a tail command. And then finally, we have the web server window over here as well. So you can see that tmuxp was actually able to save our window state and then restore those back to where we left off. Although just keep in mind that it doesn't always save some things like your command line arguments. So you might need to go into that YAML configuration file and tweak it a little bit before you actually restore it back into a new session. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi guys, up until this point, pretty much everything that we've done inside of Tmux has been centered around navigation using the keyboard. However, did you know that Tmux actually has support for using certain mouse functions as well? It's true, Tmux does work with the mouse to some extent. So let's take a look at how to configure it to enable mouse support and then some of the different features that work with the mouse. So first of all, I wanted to mention that if you are running an older version of Tmux, there is a different configuration path to go down where each of the mouse options can be en enabled individually. Whereas with Tmux version 2.1 and later, there is a global mouse feature just called mouse that you can set to on. Now, just be aware that some of the different options here to that are in individually enabled for earlier versions of Tmux are things like resizing panes or selecting an active pane if you have multiple panes in a single window. And you can also select a window directly down on the status bar where you have a list of windows horizontally. You can actually just click on one of those and select the active window that you would like to use. Also, you can scroll back through the buffers, through your terminal buffers, using the mouse scroll wheel as well. Plus, there's even a right-click context menu that you can use as well. So basically, what I've done here so far, let me hit Control b d to detach from tmux, and I'll just show you my tmux configuration file at .tmux.conf. So right now, the only settings that I really have are just a custom key binding. I actually commented this out so it's not active. And then this third option here is the one I want to draw your attention to, which is just set option dash global mouse on. So basically that just enables all of the mouse features. And if we reattach to our session using tmux at, you can see that if I use the mouse scroll wheel, it automatically puts me into the scrolling mode so that I can scroll back through my buffer. Now, by default, if you don't have mouse mode enabled, using the mouse scroll wheel to scroll through your history won't actually work correctly. Now, down here on the bottom of the status bar here, I've got two different windows open. One is just my tail command, and the other is an interactive bash shell. And as you can see, just by left-clicking on them, 
I am actually able to very easily switch between windows instead of having to use my prefix key, control B, one, and then control B, zero, to select which window I want to use. So being able to just click on the window that you'd like to be active is a nice helper. Now, one other kind of cool thing that you can do is actually right click, and you actually have to hold the right click button here to be able to choose from this menu. But as I move my mouse up and down, I can actually choose these different menu options. So I can kill the window, I can respawn the window, I can swap panes up and down if I'd like to, and I can split my view here both vertically and horizontally, which is really nice. Just having that, those basic features of Tmux at your fingertips using the right-click context menu is pretty nice. If you'd like to select a pane from multiple panes here, so let me just split back my view here a little bit. And if, if you recall from an earlier video, we were using the prefix key, control B and then Q, to display a little overlay here with the pane numbers, and then we can very easily switch between them. So I can do control B, Q, one if I want this bottom left one, or control B, Q, two to select this one on the right. Well, one of the nice things about the mouse support is that I can not only choose which window I want to be active, but I can actually just click in the pane that I'd like to be active as well. So that just makes Tmux a little bit easier to navigate. So I would encourage you to play around with mouse mode and just get a look and feel for how that functionality works. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi guys and welcome back. Thanks for joining me on this video skill where we learned about Tmux, the terminal multiplexer, an open source utility that helps you to be more productive inside the Linux operating system. And I guess it also runs on Mac too, so you could use it there. Anyways, going forward, I would really encourage you to get Tmux installed, play around with it, learn some of the basic default key bindings before you get any further. The reason I encourage people to learn about the default key bindings instead of jumping into customization right away is because the customization can take time. And if you come across a system that somebody else has built that does not have your custom configuration applied to it, then you might you know, you might want to actually use your custom configuration just naturally anytime that you launch Tmux, and that may not always be present. So it's good to actually know the default key bindings inside of Tmux, so that if you come across a system that you haven't personally built or customized, then you're able to easily navigate around the utility with ease. So the other things I would recommend doing is looking up some other custom configurations that other people have created. There's a lot of open source kind of just freely available Tmux configs on GitHub that people have created and use on a regular basis. And you can learn a lot about how to customize Tmux by examining the configurations that other people have created. Additionally, there are some features in Tmux that we didn't take a look at in this video skill, like how to lock and unlock a session, very similar to how you would lock your desktop on a Windows, Linux, or Mac desktop machine, you can actually lock the Tmux session as well and then unlock it later on when you're back at your computer. Additionally, there's the ability to use buffers, which is very similar in Vim, to using buffers to copy and paste text and move it around your different Tmux windows using adept keyboard navigation. In any case, I hope you guys enjoyed this skill and we'll see you next time. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.